Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Stefan, and today we're gonna to go one by one through the different geophysical layers of our planet, the energies that they contain, and how they interact with us biologically at the cellular, molecular, and even quantum scales. Because our entire universe is electric, going from our sun to our radiation belts, and then we're gonna dive into very large energetic outbursts like Earth's tallest lightning, Schumann Resonance's mega burst, and talk about how these changing electromagnetic fields and energies influence us at the cellular level, how they can even turn on cellular stress responses by directly interacting with DNA, and much more. So a lot to go over in this video, including the full moon that we have coming up, and some of the planetary geometry we have there. Uh, and so to start, we can look at our solar disk, and actually the sun has been fairly quiet recently. So this is our wavelength of light that shows solar flares very nicely. You can see not much solar flare activity. We have had a couple very weak M-class flares recently. They haven't been very broad in terms of time duration. They've been very, very brief and quick. We actually saw one go there. This is a different frequency of light that we can look at that shows some of the, the filaments that the sun holds onto and looks a little bit more at the corona, some of the, uh, some of the dynamics in the solar corona. So you can see some flows here, but again, not that busy of a sun, and that explains why it's been fairly quiet on Earth recently. And actually, we have a really good ramp of energy to talk about here at the Schumann Residences. You can see how it went from quiet to then with this big burst. And I wanna talk about how you should be mindful of sometimes how these energies quiet down and then how they can sneak up on you in terms of their power and to be aware of that. So before we go into that though, let's look at our solar magnetogram, our solar intensity gram. Just FYI, we do have two big sunspots um, that are rotating Earth direct, like completely Earth direct. Here's the first one, there's the second. This is looking at the magnetic field of the Earth and there you can actually see the sunspots. They're pretty close to each other on different hemispheres. Uh, about the same size, and they'll be Earth direct about a day, you know, day for this one, maybe two days for that one after the release of this video. So they can still potentially flare, uh, and they're big enough to have a large flare, uh, but uh, it depends on how stable their magnetic fields are and a lot of things. And even if they're over here, or even on the side, if either one of the sunspots or both of them uh, do a big CME or flare or something, that could still result in a geomagnetic storm depending on the space weather conditions that result. Now, if we look at our uh, radiation belt, this is going one step closer towards the Earth. So here is the Earth right there. You can see it rotating. And here are these uh, belts of highly energetic ions, protons, electrons, oxygen ions, helium ions. And these get charged up by the solar wind, by cosmic forces, and a few other things. So you can see that uh, there on August 18th or so, if we rewind, our radiation belts are actually fairly decharged. There was a bit of a ion precipitation event where some of these ions that came in then went further into the Earth, into the ionosphere, where that gigantic lightning actually was touching. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But we can see over the past uh, few days, the radiation belts have been at a medium value or so. So if you look at the flux down there at the bottom, they haven't been supercharged up. They haven't been uh, super decharged. They're at about a medium level. You can see the changing magnetic field stimulated or uh, simulated here. Um, so overall, the Earth has kind of quieted down from some of the very strong energetic flows that have been happening over the past couple months. And that's important because that is a stress response to the body. Geophysical energies, these geomagnetic changes whether it's at the radiation belt level, the ionospheric level, weather storms, weather patterns that are going through, changes in the Schumann resonances, all of these can influence our biology. So we can kind of get used to that stress response. And then when things get quiet, um, you can kind of get thrown for a loop when then things start to increase again because you get used to that lower, uh, quieter, more de-stressed position. So we have the Schumann resonances that really nicely show this right here. 
if we actually zoom in, the, these are electromagnetic waves that reverberate uh, around the Earth. If you want to have a very simple definition, you can actually measure them in the Earth's surface, in the lithosphere. They're one of the strongest electromagnetic uh, currents that you can measure naturally. Uh, they exist in between the ionosphere, the upper electrically charged atmosphere, and the Earth's surface. But you can actually measure these out in the ionosphere and then out beyond the ionosphere into space, into the radiation belts and beyond because they exist as electromagnetic ion cyclotron resonance waves. So these frequencies that exist at 8 hertz, you can see the first mode there, 8 hertz, 14 hertz for mode 2, uh, we have 20 hertz for mode 3, 25 or so uh, hertz for mode 4 and 33. These exist uh, stably across time. You can see them there. They have a higher uh, power level than the other frequencies that exist in the 0 to 40 hertz um, spectrum that we're looking at. And we're going to dive into some new information that we have from the Space Observing System. Uh, some interesting signals that we saw there on the 21st of August, right there. Uh, so there's actually quite a lot to talk about. Uh, but I do want to dive into some of the other factors at play before we go to the Schumacher Resonances and talk about this big burst here that actually went to an amplitude of 78. Because um, I don't want to jump around too much at that point. So let's go first to some of the other things that are happening right now. Um, Interesting temperature uh, distributions on our planet. You can see that North America is having a heat wave right now, especially in the eastern half of the U.S. Temperature there, 42.1 centigrade. Very, very hot. That is uh, high 90s, low 100s. It was even hotter at times. It's cooled off a little bit. But you'll also notice South America, which is in their winter period, is also having a heat wave. So most of Brazil right now, and also uh, the northern part of South America, you know, temperatures of 39.3 centigrade right there, 37, 35, that's hot. That's very, very hot. I'm sure anyone that's in this zone right now can attest to that because look there, 43, ooh, ouch. Uh, so we're having some interesting uh, weather patterns where it's very hot in the summer for the northern hemisphere and also for kind of the winter for the southern hemisphere. Now we are getting close to the September equinox where it's kind of the seasons are equal but we still are in summer for north and winter for south. Africa of course is hot. Europe has been pretty cool, nice and cool in Europe recently. Uh, same with Australia which is makes sense because they are in their winter. Uh, you can even look at like New Zealand and Tasmania, some cold temps there, negative 0.3 centigrade. Uh, but in general, a bit of an anomaly here, getting a lot of heat manifesting in the Northern Hemisphere, in um, North America, in South America, then also this uh, North Africa and Middle East region. Now we do have a, um, a, a CME space weather model to look at really quick. There was a minor coronal mass ejection that launched on like the 23rd or so right here, but it's not expected to have any large impacts with our planet. It was quite weak, though it is changing the interplanetary medium a little bit in terms of plasma density and radial velocity of that plasma density. So just FYI, these predictions are not always 100% accurate, so this may have an influence. You can see it connecting with this model that they uh, ran, the simulation, you can see it connecting there with this co-rotating interaction region. So perhaps this plasma then gets fed back in and creates a stronger co-rotating interaction region than we would otherwise would have seen. Uh, but that is, um, that is unknown. Now the big thing to check out is this uh, solar flare that we just, or this Schumann resonances burst that we just recently had. Very, very, very big release of energy in the Schumann resonances just in the past few hours. I'm sure a lot of my regular viewers uh, felt that because uh, a lot of people here are biologically sensitive and went all the way up to an amplitude of 78 for mode one at about 7.5 hertz, 63 for mode two, about 13.5 hertz or so. You know, the frequencies go down and the power rating goes up. And then we had a amplitude high of 51 for mode three at around probably 19.5 hertz, you know, the standard is 20 hertz. 
and then 45 for mode four. So what you can just look at quickly here at the amplitude is now when you have this amplitude of 78, all the other amplitude variations for mode one become basically a flat line. They, if they, they really get put into context. Or for example, this uh, burst that we had in the Schumann resonance here, these two, this one and then that one, they are flattened and look quite weak in comparison to this. So it really just goes to show you how big of a change this is in the Schumann resonances going from here to even here. And then let's say we go to August 21st, you can see just how quiet everything was. And actually, if you go back to the 19th and the 17th and so, it was even uh, quieter in the Schumann resonances, uh, but to, for formatting reasons, I didn't put that data in. So you can see how it's such a dark blue color here. The power levels are very low. And then we get this slow ramp up here increasing, 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 increasing until we get this big burst. So this can sneak up on, uh, up on you at times and we'll go into the effect that these electromagnetic fields have on our health and wellness and on our cellular stress response. But what I wanna highlight quickly is that there's a phrase of everything in moderation, but moderation changes depending on the current situation at play. So if you are not that stressed out, your moderation limit's higher. You can have more of that dark chocolate. You can have more of these things that may not be good for you and it doesn't have the greatest effect. But it, as things increase, or let's say you're closer to your stress limit, then your moderation limit has to go down if you wanna stay healthy um, and, and not get sick or something, for example. If you don't wanna be exposed to uh, attack vectors like a virus or an illness. Um, so when you have these very slowly and subtly increasing energies in these very important biologically relevant electromagnetic fields like the Schumann resonances, then you have to really be mindful and pay attention to your health and wellness to see how it's changing because you may, you may feel fine here. You may be able to get away with certain things. Let's say it's less sleep. Let's say it's less water. Let's say it's more exercise and less recovery. Let's say it's uh, dietary decisions that aren't the best for you, whatever it is, partying. And then as these things increase, you really have to be mindful, feel them, so then you can consciously reduce those things that are taking you closer to a stress limit because you don't know when a Schumann resonances burst like this may happen. It can happen at any point and that can critically stress you. So just wanted to highlight that uh, because look at how these amplitudes and the duration of them puts everything else into context. You can see those frequency drops. Uh, these interact with our brain waves, our heart rhythms, our central nervous system rhythms, our parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous system rhythms, the autonomic nervous system. So these uh, bioelectric rhythms are in many ways governed by the geomagnetic uh, activity of our planet. They're closely correlated and uh, most likely causative. So uh, just be mindful of those factors. And um, one thing that's really, really great that's happened recently is that we now actually have data and uh, notes from the space observing system as to what we're actually looking at. I'm a very precise person and they did not have uh, clear data on what we were actually looking at with this. This is a spectrogram, we know that. They call it a sonogram. It's a way to look at frequency across, um, it's a way to look at the power of a frequency across time, and the power is given by these colors. But they didn't tell us whether it was the vertical electric field, the uh, north-south magnetic component, the east-west magnetic component. Well, now if we go to their website, you can actually see here, uh, this is, this, it's in Russian because it's out of uh, Tomsk, Russia. If we go to Schumann Resonances there, uh, we see that they put in a brief research uh, review and then also a, how they measure these ELF signals there. So here is their research brief history um, and you can translate this if you want. If you don't uh, read Russian, you can translate it. Here is their method of measuring it and they go in depth into how they collect all this. So I summarized it back on the slide. If you wanna read this specifically, it's very, very good information. And they tell you that it is the vertical electric field that we're looking at 
when we examine this data. So we are, I'm so happy that they finally released this information so we can be very, very precise with what we're looking at. We're looking at the zero to 40 Hertz vertical electric field out of Tom's Russia from August 21st to the 25th. Um, and one other thing that's been cleared up too with this is they, they explain what the quality factor is. There's been some uh, confusion as to what the quality factor is amongst different people who comment on the Schumann resonances uh, from the station on YouTube. This is precisely what they said, Russian translated to English. The quality factor of a resonant mode is the ratio of the resonant frequency value to the bandwidth at half the power of the maximum value or at a level of 0 0.707 of the maximum amplitude of the corresponding Schumann resonance mode. Basically what that means is that they look at the the resonant frequency value. So they look at the different uh, Schumann resonances. There's mode one at 7.8 hertz on average, mode two. We're gonna look at mode three, three here at 20 hertz. They look at the power there and they take the ratio of that power of that resonant frequency mode to the general bandwidth power at, the, uh, at half the power of the maximum value that they observe. So we go back here really quick and you see that they have this graphic there, schematic representation of the determination of the instantaneous values. Uh, we won't go into it too much, but basically this is, uh, they have a lot of complicated math that uh, they use to arrive to this sonogram as they call it, spectrogram as we would call it. And so the quality factor is a way of measuring the, um, basically the power in the system at a given moment in time compared to the standard resting power that exists in that system, in that resonating standing wave. So why this is important is because Q, uh, quality three, the, so the quality factor for mode three here spiked to 140 on the 21st of August as measured at the space observing system. Why is because we had this interesting little energy burst there about 17.8 hertz or so, 17.5, 18 hertz, if you just want to round it up. And that is connected, it's right in between modes two and modes three, but that energy got lumped into the quality mode for mode three. Now, the reason that this is significant is because last time we saw huge increases in the quality factors for modes three and four, we had a earthquake four days later in Turkey that was a magnitude 7.8, and those were pre-earthquake signals. So I don't know what this is. It's very small. The other ones are much larger and more significant, but the quality factor did increase dramatically. So something to be aware of, this is you, this may be a pre-earthquake signal. Regardless, it's an interesting, strange observation. It's definitely an anomaly. Uh, so what that is, I don't know. But it spiked that quality factor for mode 3 all the way to 140, which is basically off the charts. Uh, mode 4 is typically the, the one that has the biggest quality spikes. You can see this spike there, the 31, right before 4. And that's because of this guy right there, some little bump. Uh, right in mode four of the Schumann resonances, but generally these qualities are hanging out under 10 or so, or at the most under 20. So 140 is a massive increase in the energy at that uh, frequency of uh, light. Now, uh, how does the space observing system measure the Schumann resonances? Well, vertical electric field signals are received by a five meter high WIP antenna and amplified by a highly sensitive amplifier fed to two low-pass filters connected in series designed to limit the frequency band of the signals coming from the antenna to 40 hertz. So they're measuring zero to 40 hertz and they have some uh, electronics there to make sure they're getting a zero to 40 hertz signal. Then an active low-pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 31.5 hertz is used with, with attenuation beyond the cutoff frequency being at least 24 uh, decibels per octave. So I put that in there because that's really important. An active low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 31.5 Hertz is used. And it, it attenuates anything below that at least 24 decibels. So you can actually see very clearly where that goes and clicks in. They, that, that filter, that low pass filter is the reason why these energies here look so much weaker than these others. So, you have to keep in mind when we are looking at Schumann resonances data out of Tomsk, Russia, 
Mode five here is artificially being weakened via their algorithm. It's normally perhaps not this quiet but it, or this weak, but because they have that minimum 24 decibel reduction uh, on anything that's a frequency higher than 31.5 hertz, so from 31.5 hertz to 40, everything is immediately dropped down 24 decibels or more. So just want to, uh, for those that are regular watchers and listeners, or if you're new to this and you're interested, if there are big increases in mode five, in mode six of the Schumann resonances as measured by the space observing system, please know that those are actually stronger than depicted. Uh, like for example, here we get this increase in mode five, uh, more so than we have over there there. This is actually stronger than um, expected. And modes three, four, and five are connected to earthquake activity. So we get a bit of a flare up there, some interesting striping there in mode five as well. And all that is reduced in strength uh, because of that low pass filter. So uh, some interesting activity in mode five, but really is this big burst of activity in the Schumann resonances just over the past few hours that is the most notable. And it really shows how these energies can sneak up on you because it was nice and quiet on the 21st, so it was the sun. 22nd, we started to get a little bit stronger and now we're back in uh, Schumann Resonance's flare territory again. So we'll see what the next few days have in store. We do have a full moon coming up, which could contribute to more Schumann Resonance's burst. I have the uh, full moon set up right here. It's on 31st of August at 1.35 a.m. UTC time. There is our alignment, moon, earth, sun, and when the moon, this is not to scale by the way, but for graphic uh, representation, when the moon is situated here, solar wind is pushing against Earth's magnetosphere, and as a result, it forms a magneto tail, and when the moon passes into that magneto tail, it can actually push uh, energy out of the magneto tail, let's get rid of that, it can push energy out of the magneto tail and funnel it back towards Earth. So uh, when the moon is transiting in that manner like this, when it's going through there, it can fling plasma that's stored in the magneto tail back towards Earth, and that can result in Schumann resonances burst. I have old videos that look at that, um, so you can uh, watch those. They're back in last year, but there's a, a lot there. One other thing to note with this full moon on the 31st of August, it's in the sign of Pisces, if you follow Western uh, tropical astrology, it's in the sign of, uh, I suppose it'd be Aries, if it's, um, if it's uh, Vedic, uh, sidereal, but it's also pretty much conjunct Saturn. So just in terms of planetary geometry, we have Venus, Mercury, Earth, all kind of in a group right here, and then the Moon and Saturn all playing together. So. Just some interesting factors at play there. I uh, wanted to show you, but we have that coming up on the 31st of August. So it looks like we may have more of these energy creases coming up as the moon starts interacting more directly with Earth's magnetic field and the energy that's contained in the outer reaches of the magneto tail. Um, so one thing that explains this Schumann resonances burst is that we had some big ionospheric changes over the past couple days. So we can look at that quickly here. Uh, this is the uh, ionospheric map as done by the, as calculated by the Australian Space Weather Agency. And I'll just go back to the beginning. This is August 23rd. Um, this is the difference megahertz from yesterday. So if there's light colors, there isn't a big difference in the frequency of the F2 region of the ionosphere. This is the upper layer of the ionosphere. So we're going from the radiation belts now to the ionosphere. And it's these ionosphere currents that drive weather patterns that can often result in Schumann resonances bursts and also are connected to things like these giant lightning jets. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but you can see here with this graphic that the ionosphere, the difference, the megahertz difference was fairly quiet on the 23rd 24th of August, but we recently just had a big, big, big increase in the energies of the F2 layer, which results in a decrease in the frequency. 
So you can see there it goes very, very dark red right there and very much so, um, and now it's back to the 23rd. So we had, if we go back, we can zoom through, big, big, big drops in the F2 frequency and that could explain this Schumann resonances flare that we saw right here. So wanted to uh, have you be aware of that. Now, this is something really interesting I saw on spaceweather.com. Shout out to them, great website to follow for anything space weather and more. They always have interesting things. Gigantic jets over tropical storm Franklin. I'm highlighting this because in my last video, I talked about the tropical storm that hit Southern California, how that may have triggered a magnitude 5.1 earthquake uh, right in that area, in, just to the northwest uh, of uh, SoCal. And Tropical Storm Franklin is, um, on August 20th, was photographed with these gigantic jets. Uh, so thanks to Frankie for photographing these. And you can see Tropical Storm Franklin here. Gigantic jets are sometimes called Earth's tallest lightning because they reach all the way to the ionosphere 50 miles above. So that's about 100 kilometers or so. So they're interacting with the ionosphere. And they are a supersized version of sprites. Uh, and tropical storms are a good place to find them. So even though this wasn't a hurricane, even a tropical storm can have these extremely energetic events like this. We can look at the image more closely here that he captured. And you can see the evolution of this lightning just bursting up massive, massive release of energy from this tropical storm system. And you can just get a sense of how these electromagnetic energies uh, are condensed and combined and travel across our planet. Now these storm systems uh, as you can see with these energies, this releases energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, all the way at the Schumann frequencies, up into the radio frequency band, visible light, obviously he captured it with his camera, right? And then they gave you release gamma rays. So it's electromagnetism in general that interacts with our, uh, our cells, with our DNA. And so these things that happen here, while they may be rare, these are just very big, powerful examples of things that can interact with us biologically. And the more that these happen, the more that the cellular stress response is going to be activated. And that's what I want to dive into now. Um, just want to make sure that there's nothing else here on our slide. Okay, so there's a great paper uh, that came out in 2009 called Electromagnetic Fields, Stress Living Cells that goes into these dynamics. And we're just gonna look at some of the highlights uh, because this is very relevant to all of us because it seems that these electromagnetic events are increasing in intensity as more energy is coming into our planet between solar cycle 25, between us having changed the, uh, the kind of atmospheric composition, it's holding onto more energy as a result. Um, so there's a greater electromagnetic uh, potentials on our planet right now, and this means potentially more stress for us, biologically, at the cellular level, and then also manifesting into our actual daily lives. So electromagnetic fields, EMF, and both the extremely low frequency and radio frequency ranges activate the cellular stress response. Now, important thing to take note here too is in addition to these natural electromagnetic fields that are increasing in frequency and power because of solar cycle 25, we're also layering on more and more electromagnetic energy uh, artificially between the power grids, cellular grids, Wi-Fi, cell phones, uh, television signals, radio waves, all these things interact with us at the cellular DNA scales. In induction of the stress response involves activation of DNA and despite the large difference in energy between extremely low frequency and radio frequency, this is in the hertz range, you know, 10, 20, 30 hertz, this is in the megahertz and gigahertz range, so billions of times per second, the same cellular pathways respond to both frequency ranges. So extremely uh, electromagnetic fields could interact directly with electrons in DNA, while low energy electromagnetic fields interact with DNA to induce a stress response, 
increasing electromagnetic field energy in the radio frequency range can lead to breaks in DNA strands. So we're not only dealing with more geophysical energies and uh, natural, like the Schumann resonances and strong weather systems, we're also dealing with all the electrosmog that we've put out. And that's really the heart of this message here is that uh, as we keep layering on electromagnetic fields to our environment, to our location in space and time, we're gonna have more and more biologic interactions with these fields and typically, it seems, they activate the uh, stress response through specific gene expression. Electromagnetic fields induce gene expression and the synthesis of specific proteins generated considerable controversy. The fact that this does this generated considerable controversy from, of course, power companies, government agencies, physicists, and most recently, cell phone companies. So they have a vested interest, of course, in uh, not telling you this. It is now generally accepted that weak electromagnetic fields in the power frequency range, that's 50, 60 hertz, which is what our power grids run on, can activate DNA to synthesize proteins. Now, what are these proteins? Uh, these are things like heat shock proteins, stress proteins. DNA can no longer be considered unaffected by environmental electromagnetic field levels. It can also be activated and damaged by electromagnetic fields at levels that are considered, as of right now, safe. So what they call safe electromagnetic field exposure is based on the science, not safe. The vulnerability of DNA to environmental influences and the possible dangers associated with electromagnetic fields have been underscored by the discovery of electromagnetic field activation of the cellular stress response in the extremely low frequency range. That's that Schumann resonances band going from zero to 100 hertz or so. The cellular stress response is an unambiguous signal unambiguous. There's no doubting it because you can measure these things. You can measure the proteins that are being produced. It's an unambiguous signal by the cell that extreme that electromagnetic fields are potentially harmful. It really depends on how much that stress response is uh, uh, triggered and how well a person can cope with that stress response. If you have a large stress threshold, hey, you're fine. It's better to not have it, but you're still fine. But if you're at a critical stress threshold, that's where you have a problem. And more and more people are at critical stress thresholds uh, from a variety of factors, which would be beyond the scope of this video. Um, I'm sure you can fill in some of those blanks from what's happened over the past years, hint, hint. Okay, there are protective mechanisms at the cellular level known as a cellular stress response. These mechanisms are activated by damage to cellular components such as DNA and protein. So remember, the, electro, the extremely low frequency fields can interact with DNA and alter gene expression, and the higher frequency radio frequency bands in the megahertz and gigahertz range have been shown to induce DNA strand breaks. So the actual DNA strand can break, and that causes either, and it can be repaired if it's a single strand break, and if it's a double strand break, it causes cellular death. Um, the, the responses are characterized by increased levels of stress proteins, indicating that stress response genes have been upregulated in response to the stress. The first stress response mechanism identified was the cellular reaction to sharp increases in temperature and was referred to as heat shock. So this is just in general, the first stress response that was identified. Uh, heat shock proteins, you go into a sauna, you get some heat shock, um, and that can actually be anti-inflammatory if it's an acute stress response. Uh, heat shock proteins can be beneficial to you under certain considerations and under certain circumstances. Now, the power frequency band, so this is the extremely low frequency range, the Schumann band, but really power frequencies are 50, 60 hertz, and the radio frequency fields in the megahertz and gigahertz range um, and amplitude modulated radio frequency fields have been shown to activate the same stress response. Studies of stress protein stimulation by low frequency electromagnetic fields have focused on a specific DNA sequence in the gene promoter that codes for HSP70, heat shock protein 70, a major stress protein. So they're looking at this directly, basically. Induction of increased levels of the major stress protein, HSP70, by electromagnetic fields is rapid within five minutes. 
Also, it occurs at extremely low levels of energy input, 14 orders of magnitude lower than with a thermal stimulus. So let's go back here really quick, okay? Within five minutes, heat shock proteins can be activated by upregulation of the HSB70 gene, and that happens specifically with extremely low frequency magnetic fields, like we're looking at here with the Schumann resonances, and they don't require that strong of a power density. So when you have the uh, Schumann resonances increase to power levels 78, whereas before they were hanging out at two or three, huge increases in the power by more than order of magnitude, you can all of a sudden trigger that cellular stress response. And these are natural electromagnetic energy fields that are changing all the time. These are things that we can't really change. It's the artificial electromagnetic fields that are the ones that are increasing uh, and then we have the power to change. So those create this blanket of electromagnetic cellular stress. And then when these natural ones, which have their own natural rhythms, get lopped on top of that, that's when things can break down. So that's what I'm really highlighting for you right now going through this paper. Okay, EMF penetrates uh, directly into cells and it's not attenuated and so it can directly interact with DNA in the cell nucleus as well as with other cell constituents. Because these are magnetic fields, so the cell uh, membrane has a very strong electro, uh, electric potential, so that stops the, the penetration of electric fields into the cell to a great degree, but magnetic fields can pass through it unattenuated, basically. All go through the cellular nucleus membrane, which also has an electric uh, potential, and interact directly with DNA. Now, DNA is very conductive. It's considered a semiconductor, and it has free electrons within it that can respond to and be stimulated to move by these extremely low-frequency electromagnetic fields. Exposure to non-thermal extremely low-frequency as well as thermal radio frequency expresses, affects the expression of many cellular proteins. Radio frequency fields have been shown to activate specific transcription factor binding that stimulates cell prolifera proliferation and induces stress proteins. Um, so you don't want cell proliferation beyond what's normal. Uh, that's called cancer. Um, and so when there's an excess of cell cellular pro proliferation, that's not a good thing. Despite claims that the energy level is too low to induce changes in DNA and that devices are safe, the non-thermal effects that have been demonstrated at both extremely low frequency and radio frequency exposure levels can cause physiological changes in cells and tissues even at the level of DNA. And this provides a mechanistic link between cancer and electromagnetic field exposure. They did a bunch of 70s back, studies back in the 80s and 90s looking at electromagnetic field exposure and cancer and they found statistically significant uh, uh, connections between them. So uh, more than I can get into in this video, but I'm hoping this gives you the jumping off point. Now many different types of cells have been shown to respond to EMF both in vivo and in vitro, including epithelial, endothelial, and epidermal cells, cardiac muscle cells, and fibroblasts. Fibroblasts make up your connective tissues, which is also a semiconductor. Keep in mind here, looking at epithelial cells, a big component of your digestive system is epithelial cells. So when you have a steady increase like we see here in the Schumann resonances, going from quiet to now a burst, what that can result as is your, let's say your gut health is normal and fine here, but now you haven't really be become more and more strict and been very, very precise with what you're eating and now your gut health can suffer. So if you wanna learn more about how you can improve your gut health naturally, holistically, you can look into my Holistic Gut Health Guide. That's an ebook. It's 88 pages filled with great information on how you can naturally improve and heal your gut uh, based on my 10-year gut health journey uh, as well as a bunch of um, science into gut health. So it combines things like fasting, and, uh, and the microbiome and much more. You can actually get the chapter on the microbiome free. I'll put a link to the Holistic Gut Health Guide in the video description, because this is one of the main ways that uh, increase, a subtle increase in the Schumann resonances or these geophysical energies can manifest as a health and wellness symptom would be with your gut. 
It'd also be with your, your uh, heart rhythms. It'd be with your brain waves and kind of like your thoughts and your consciousness and your autonomic nervous system. And your autonomic nervous system is connected to your gut health, it's connected to your heart rhythms, et cetera. So quick note there, let's go back to the study. Um, and nothing there, okay. EMF DNA interaction mechanisms, electron transfer. The biochemical compounds in living cells are composed of charges and dipoles that can interact with electric and magnetic fields by various mechanisms. So proteins have dipoles, water is a dipole molecule, um, cells have their uh, own electrostatic potentials. This is very important. We have suggested that direct EMF interaction with electrons in DNA is likely for the following reasons. The largest effects of electromagnetic fields would be expressed on electrons because of their high charge to mass ratio. Electron has a mass 1800 times less than a proton. At the subatomic level, one assumes that electrons respond instantaneously to changes in electromagnetic fields compared to protons and heavier atomic nuclei. Weak electromagnetic fields, uh, these extremely low frequency fields, have been shown to affect the rates of electron transfer reactions. Displacement of electrons in DNA would cause local charging that has been shown to lead to a disaggregation of biopolymers and if that's strong enough, it can even lead to strand breaks. As the energy in an electromagnetic field stimulus increases, there is increase in single strand breaks, which can be repaired, followed by double strand breaks, which can't be repaired, suggesting the interaction with electromagnetic frequency uh, fields at all energy levels. So it's like, if it's a very weak energy level, then you have a low statistical chance of there being a strand break, but still possible. But as it goes up and up and up, these DNA breaks become more and more likely, mutations become more likely, cancer becomes more likely. Uh, and that's the big problem that we have now with layering on all these artificial electromagnetic fields. EMF can accelerate reaction rates, including electron transfer rates. EMF acts as a force that competes with the chemical forces in a reaction. Probably the most convincing evidence for a frequency sensitive mechanism that involves stimulation of DNA is activation of protein synthesis in striated muscle. So they've been able to look specifically at some of these very well known things and see how it's changed uh, with these changing electromagnetic fields. The low electromagnetic field energy can move electrons, cause small changes in charge distribution and release the large hydration energy tied up in protein and DNA structures. So it's like the you light the match that then lights off the entire uh, warehouse filled with gunpowder effectively. Electrons have been shown to move in DNA at great speed and we have suggested that radio frequency and extremely low frequency fields initiate the stress response by directly interacting and accelerate electrons moving within DNA which then activates that HSP70 stress response part of the genome, which then triggers the larger cellular stress response. Research on DNA and the stress response has shown that the same biology occurs across divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that the electromagnetic field safety standards based on cellular measures of potential harm should be much stricter. So we, we've split the electromagnetic spectrum like scientifically into different bands, but really it's a continuous spectrum in DNA and cells and the stress response and many things biologically, they don't interact with just one band or another because that's just an artificial delineation that we've made. They interact with the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Expect for the, except for the special case of the visual range, the frequency bands are not based on biology. And the separate bands now appear to be a poor way of dealing with biological responses needed for evaluating safety. Basically, uh, this is highlighting the limits, the, the failures of our, um, <laughs> of our safety standards. First and foremost, it is important to realize that the stress response occurs in reaction to a potentially harmful environmental influence. This is just a general stress response, okay? The stress response is an unambiguous indication that cells react to electromagnetic fields as potentially harmful. They're just in general stressful. And if they're within a 
uh, a stress level that we can handle, then it's fine. It's You need stress in life. It's not a bad thing. But the problem is that we're adding more and more of these stressful electromagnetic fields into our environment. And as we go to solar cycle 25, expected to peak in 2025, it's going to flare up to a high because the sun will be releasing more energy, especially ionizing energy to the earth. It is therefore an indication of compromised cell safety given by the cell in the language of the cell. So the cells are basically telling us, hey, you're stressing us out. In general, cellular processes are un unusually sensitive to fields in the environment. The biological thresholds in the extremely low frequency range are in the 0.5 to 1.0 micro Tesla range, not very much higher than the ELF backgrounds, which are 0.1 micro Tesla. So, um, yeah, it's like basically right there. And this is just based on what they've studied. It's likely that these uh, sensitivities are even lower. Finally, since both extremely low frequency and radio frequency activate the same biology, simultaneous exposure to both is probably additive and total EMF exposure is important. Safety standards must consider total EMF exposure and not separate standards for ELF and radio frequency ranges. So that study is electromagnetic field stress living cells. I hope you found that useful. Um, and I hope you found this dive into the Schumann resonances useful. Some of the new uh, data that we got from the space observing system. And I uh, wanted to talk about this burst here that we just had recently. Let me know in the comments if you felt that. And in general, if you felt this gradual ramp up that we had in the natural energies and please be aware of your, nat your, your environment, your home environment, your work environment. I would recommend that you take stock of your electromagnetic environment. You can purchase an EMF reader. I'll put a link in the video description for that. Those are very useful. I have one. It was very enlightening when I walked around the house with that EMF reader. So you can measure these electromagnetic fields, especially the radio frequency band, and get a sense, and the cellular bands and get a sense of where things are uh, hot spots. You can look at the power grid uh, and how that's broadcasting energy out. So I would like for you to, uh, if you're you know, biologically sensitive, you're interested in this, you wanna reduce your stress, improve your health and longevity, um, I recommend that you look into that. I would also recommend that you practice earthing and some of these other natural health and wellness practices that can help you manage these stresses uh, and these, the, these accumulating energies in your body. I just made a video on that, so you can watch that here. Uh, if you like the video, please click the thumbs up. Helps this channel grow, supports this channel. Uh, subscribe to see more videos like this. Uh, you can just scroll through my uploads to see kind of all the different topics I cover. I try to cover everything holistically. I don't funnel myself into one single niche. So you really learn everything here if you subscribe and follow along. So I hope to see you in future videos. And thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. Here are some more videos on screen that you can watch to continue your education into this. And I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day, and I'll see you then. Ciao.